set up for a brick your head, huh? But first, we have an incredible panel here tonight. And uh, I want to thank the gentleman for coming. I don't know if everyone knows, probably goes without saying, but I want to introduce him. Let's start with Z. Z has been playing forever. And I don't know if you guys know Z, but you know he was there at Berkeley. He was there at the Rose Bowls. He was there for all of them. <laughs> and, and he's got the greatest stories. If you ever get a chance to hang out with Z, the stories that come out are incredible. And who else dreams and it becomes a move? The dreamer. <laughs> Next to him is John Kirkland. JK, the first time I laid eyes on JK was probably 1980. We're in Sarasota. Was it frightening? Cus- <laughs> it's a little frightening, though. Yeah, it was very frightening. It's Halloween. <laughs> but any day you meet John, it's frightening. No. Uh, in 1980 in Sarasota, I uh, went down there. It was me and Kessler driving for a weekend, and we show up. Kirkland's the man. He's jamming. He's doing against the spin moves. Here's what I remember. We were actually in the cafeteria. We had about 100 people in there. And somebody had one of the Velcro minis. And John from about here in the back of the room. They're like, John, you try it, you try it. Bullseye. Yeah. Classic Kirkland. The man, I appreciate him coming because he has a wealth of knowledge. He has, if you think my desk are nice, he has, I'm guessing, 40,000 discs in his garage. Unbelievable. Does anybody want them? Please. <laughs> we got a lot of Humphreys, we'll tell you. The great John Kirkland, everyone. <laughs> and, and clearly, Stork needs no introduction. We've all been at some tournament he ran, some event. You know, he really has been our father of yeah, prison. Definitely. I support that father of the sport, this guy. This guy, right? Nobody yeah. Yeah. This guy. Yeah. All those great tournaments, all that promotion, all that stuff from Lama, it was JK, so we're honored to have him here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Stork. How much money did he ever have? John, hey, hey, Joel, I think John wishes he worked for Lama. <laughs> And and on the very end, Victor Malafanti. Victor wrote the book, the Frisbee book. I don't know if you've seen it. A great collector. Victor was there in the early days. Some of the early memories, and this is why I have them here, so I can ask them about the early memories. Some of my early memories are, are, you know, Victor doing the Harlem Globetrotter tour with John. And... And he was the original world champion. <laughs> so my question to him, I was sitting around and I was going, well, I, I don't know when the first freestyle tournament was. I don't know who the first person was. I don't know why they went from throwing on the beach to going, hey, let's put this in the Whammo tournaments. So, that's the kind of questions I want to ask. You're welcome to ask some questions, but I just want to find out our early freestyle history. So, where did freestyle start? What was freestyle? What did you, it seems like to me, you probably were throwing back and forth. And then you did a trip catch. What, John, what would you think the first concept of freestyle, not throw and catch, but actual freestyle, I don't need that. All right. <laughs> it was probably the same for everybody else. You saw a disc, and it was a magical thing. When you were a kid, I mean, I was 10. I'm in North Carolina, and I see a green poodle button. And I remember it like I remember when Kennedy was killed. I mean, it's just one of those islands in the sea of humdrummery. And once you see that thing flying, you want to do stuff with it. And it turns out that all I ever tried to do was throw it really hard and throw it exactly where I wanted it to go. That's what we did. We just, we weren't really doing freestyle. Actually, the only freestyle move I ever did before the late 60s was just, bam. I just <laughs> thought it would be cool. Let's stand up, let's see that move well, again. No. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, Kind of it's because it's, it's something that I always, that I always, it was like, something I always really liked was 
something Roger uh, Barrett used to call Trompe meaning it fools the eye. I always thought it would be really cool to just kind of go, hey, I got it, bam. Or, hey, I got it, and trailing edge, that kind of stuff. I wanted to make your prediction different than what happened. Oh, he said, oh, you get the, oh, what the hell? It's the same thing as when you first see a Frisbee, so that was... Like the triple fake. fake. Show us the original triple, triple fake. fake. Well, no, it wasn't a triple fake. It wasn't Kerry <laughs> Colmar's, I'll catch it here, I'll catch it here. Oh, the triple, no. <laughs> it, was, it was just, uh, I got it, bam. <laughs> that was what I used to do in the 60s. But it, to be fair, it seems sort of like doing tricks with a disc was sort of... Um, I mean, it's like, so you can catch it here, or you can catch it here, or you can catch it. You're still just catching it. The part is going back and going, you know. So until I saw Victor Malafronte, I thought that freestyle stuff was just, it was sort of like making a lot out of a little. You know what I mean? It was sort of like being sort of, um, and then it's, it's, it's showing. Let's just get back to the plot. Until I saw this guy going, yeah. bam, bam, zoom. So I will turn I will turn the floor over to this young man because he is the only person ever to blow my mind in Frisbee. Nobody nobody else. I, I saw the interview, thank you very much. I was totally shocked by the way you say that. Hey. I had to ask him what the hell was it that shocked you? Can you can you still throw that behind the back? Yes. Hey, well, let's, no, 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 I'm going to hurt somebody. No, I'm going to hurt somebody. 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 I'm going to Oh! That was pretty good. Now, if he had done that, I probably wouldn't have ever freestyled again. So, so Victor, what did start you? You were throwing frisbee. Well, what started freestyle for you? What, what made you go, this is beyond throw and catch. This is an event. Well, let me say this. When I arrived in Berkeley, uh, my brother and I uh, we left Brooklyn, New York for Berkeley. And uh, we just got out of the Marine Corps after four years. So you can imagine the culture shock of going to Berkeley, coming out of the Marine Corps. <laughs> I'm from, uh, from a Catholic, very strict family. And I ended up in Berkeley, and uh, all of a sudden there's this like circus around you. There, there's so much stimulus from so many different people, so many, you know, the, the cultures that they had up there, this, the, everything. It was what I called the circus. That's what I named uh, ult, the, uh, their ultimate team, the Berkeley Flying, Flying Circus. And when I arrived there, the first person I met was this uh, young lady, and she said her name was Sativa. And she had, she, had, she had a little dog named Zigzag, and she said she was 16, and I believed her, so all birds leave the road. So we went, we went off and had, and had a really good time. And her sister, but, Ithaca? Oh. <laughs> but, later. but this is what I saw Frisbee-wise when I arrived at Berkeley. My dad told me I, I had a red Frisbee when I was a kid, I really don't remember it. But at any rate, in Berkeley, there was Sprout Plaza, which is which is which has four buildings protecting it from any kind of wind going through there. So it was ideal for freestyle. And there were guys who and I used to once in a while you always hang up on camp, hang out on campus because you want to pick up on young ladies and all this other stuff, which was you know many years ago. And uh, and so what I saw was I saw people like uh, Chuck Pitt and Dave Book. And what they were doing, uh, Chuck Pitt, he did, this, he did this question mark skip shot. And the, the disc never left the ground, and they made this question mark. Overhand and, wrist flip, grip. Yeah, and, he, and I said, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I've never seen this shit. Wow, frisbee. I was pretty good at sailing flat rocks in the water. You know, so 
And so then I'm, I'm, I'm watching I'm watching more than Dave Book. Dave Book is throwing pros. He, throw, he throws a sidearm behind the back skip shot. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I ended up going right downstairs and hanging out. Just going like that, you know. Throw it at me. I want to play. Throw it at me. And I, I, I spent the whole that whole time trying to learn how to do the behind the back a shot, and my butt was sore from my hand hitting hitting myself. <laughs> That's so your hinky background. Very cute. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so did you but start? But essentially, that's that's what I saw frisbee watch. Now there were other people, other players who who came around. Uh, Roger Barrett came uh, in uh, in 1969. I think I met Roger. And he was some. Uh, he was accomplished uh, somewhat. And Steve Gottlieb, of course, Z, Z was there. And the the, uh, the main thing about the the plaza was a meeting place. And as soon as you had three people who wanted to meet there all the time and play, it just drew in other people. And we had Monica Lou and, and uh, all these other uh, all these Al, other people. Hal, Bob Eric, May. Hal Erickson and Bob May. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we had a kid on a skateboard, had a water pipe in his pocket, you know, and he could play frisbee. And we had two guys who would they play frisbee on a bicycle, they'd go around in a circle. <laughs> they were pretty good at that. We had Jay Shelton and Steve Sewell. It was Jay, Jay Shelton who showed me that somebody could be really smooth, and he had this, this sidearm snap on the disc. It was just a little ting. And that disc went like it was on a magnet or something. I was oh, so impressed. I, just, I saw that. And he was the first one. I saw him do this with his backhand throw. So I used it for the really hype shot and to whip it around. But I'm going to hurt myself if I, <laughs> if I do that today. So anyway, uh, so Berkeley actually was the mecca, really, a frisbee for many, many, many. We had the first. We had the first college campus golf course with, was on Berkeley, and then the Berkeley guys. We played everything. One thing we couldn't understand. Not you guys don't get it. <laughs> the specialist. You know, people only did one thing with frisbee. We couldn't grasp that. We didn't understand why don't you want to? What it, you want to play golf? You know, what's wrong with ultimate? Uh, stuff like that. So that was a little hard for me to comprehend at the time because I was, I was so into it. I was living it. I was, I mean, I immersed myself in the Frisbee. I was doing Frisbee shows. Uh, Z and I uh, did the first, one of the first professional show for the Oakland A's. I think it was in 1970. There's a shot of us. Uh, they told us, whatever you do, don't run across the infield. So what do we do? We <laughs> ran across the infield. <laughs> and we're, we're out there playing. So there is a shot of our names on the scoreboard. And you could see these two little dots out there. And that, that was us. And, uh, and so anyway, there's a lot more to say about that. I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short and just to say like, and then with the, with the Frisbee Pod Company, if you were in the turn of the century, if you lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you were hungry, you could go over to the Frisbee Pie Company and get a broken pie from Ma Frisbee for a nickel. Today, you guys, you put, you can put, you put peanut butter and jelly on the bread. But when you want to shred, you put Z's on the jam. Z's on the jam. <laughs> We do secure spreads on the jam all these years later. So Stork, uh, you were on the East Coast there. You you evolved through Ultimate and or did you how did you evolve into into disc? And, 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 um Is this better or worse? Yeah, better. Um my my dad bought me uh, a a Pipco for my fifth uh, Christmas. Fifth Christmas. What year was that? Uh, well, I was, I was born in 48, so that was 53. 1953. We started. We started playing uh, pretty seriously. We didn't know. We didn't know any anybody else who played. But Dad took motorcycle trips, and we always lived along, and we always played. And and we developed what we called Eastern Trick Catch. 
which was a kind of a, a back and forth game, and you got points for different trick catches, which was essentially behind the back, behind the head, uh, on the finger, and extra points for off the ground. And we played that for many years, and actually it was one of the events in the first octet until we met JK and uh, Victor. Victor and uh, Dave Johnson, and they broke the game the first day. And that they threw so unbelievably hard that, that you couldn't do anything. And that was the end. That was the last time anybody ever played Eastern Trick Catch. Sorry. The, the moral is don't make freestyle competitive with your partner. Yeah. Yeah. We, we you didn't give know. me the 20 bucks, buddy. I had to kill it. But in terms of, in, in terms of the, I think the most interesting thing for me in retrospect when I look back on the development of the sport is, is questions of, let's call it learning, learning theory of how we, how we discovered how to do things. That's really the most intriguing thing to me when I think back on it. And one of the things that, that I speculate on is, what if we were sitting at, at Octad 74 and the judges, we had judges, and they were sitting there, you know, ready to judge those moves. And someone did a 2012 possession. <laughs> and and my guess is that the judges would go, I, I missed that. I missed yeah. that. What? I mean, I, I don't think I don't think that we could mentally process. I don't think we could have mentally processed what's being done now. In the same way that they tell us that that Mayans were on the beach when the, uh, the Spanish ships came and they, they couldn't see them because they couldn't really conceive of the possibility. So, I mean, I remember specifically, we went to IFT, Jimmy Scala and I went to IFT and we had only in hand Stancil's book. We figured that the, the, the sidearm was a, a joke because we had thrown all the backhands and the very first sidearm when we got there the very first sidearm that i ever saw was victor's <laughs> the macho sidewinder arguably the best sidearm ever yeah you didn't the, see it for very long right <laughs> it's the first one that i saw and at the same meet i saw on returns at the guts match you'd return a pro and alan blake of the highland avenue aces would multiple tip it before he caught it. And Jimmy and I are looking at that. And I said, oh, well, he's got to be spinning it up, accelerating it somehow. I mean, he's doing something to keep the spin on it. I mean, I, I just couldn't even possibly conceive of the fact that there was enough spin on the disc to, to do that tipping. And we went home and, tr and tried to do it for weeks and weeks. And I mean, our, our, our knuckles were, were raw <laughs> from trying to do a simple multiple tip. I mean, when I think back on how slow each step was, it, it's, it's just amazing. And now, how quickly people can come in. I mean, you know, players come in now and they've grown up on video. They've seen your moves on video and they come and they're already pretty accomplished. I mean, it's like online poker. You know, right. the disc, the wow. disc. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, I need to add something here. Uh, John Kirkland, the great John Kirkland, uh, Globe Charter Tour that we went on. This was something that John put together. He made the contacts. He convinced the people that uh, have us audition. Uh, to go on a national tour with the Holland Globe Trotters, the same people that I used to watch Sunday afternoon ABC Wild World of Sports, and I'm on the freaking bus with Mark with Menelard Lemon and Curly. And anyway, uh, they took out every other we seat. Went, I'm talking. <laughs> we the went, wouldn't fit, you had to take half the seats we, so <laughs> we, we went to a different city every day for six months. Every day was a different city for six months. The thrill of doing this with John, I think it's, it's only something that John and I know. Because it hasn't, it hasn't 
been done by anyone else. I, I don't know if it ever will be achieved. It may in, in, in the future, but when you're playing on the aisle deep, I, I, ideal environment on a basketball hardwood court with no wind, and you can throw boomerang throws that the audience thinks it's going to go flying into the audience, but it goes behind the air conditioning, it disappears, and it comes down around the basket, and John goes, bing! <laughs> they flipped out. <laughs> and so did we. And when the Globetrotters didn't want to stuff, John used to almost be able to stuff the Frisbee on the basket. And they said, oh, we couldn't do that because you're taking away right. from the Globetrotters. Right. Right. So we decided, shit, we're just going to throw it three-quarter court. Right. And that's what we did. And just, we just blew people away. We played at one time five Frisbees at one time. It was the only time it was ever done. Well, I think we did it in two rotations, and, and that, that was it. The one time we did five Frisbees at the same time. So this was an incredible thing for me, uh, it, and it was a pleasure beyond my wildest dreams that I could ever find the words to describe to live that way for six months and hear these people cheer and really dig what you were doing. And you're we, we would, we wanted to get there early so we could just play more. They only want us to play eight minutes. We had 24 minute shows that we were doing. <laughs> the Globe Charters were sticking their head out the door, get them off the court, get them off the court. And they, so they, we had to shorten up our, our, our act. We, we, it was a wonderful time. And, and John Kirkland, you are the great John Kirkland. Yeah. Yeah. One thing to that story, and that is that that I, I got a chance to see them play twice. Uh, once was at Lehigh when I sold you that really overpriced uh, pie team. <laughs> the only one. And then we went to see them play in Madison Square Garden. Oh, man. And, and all the whammo execs were there. I mean, it was huge. And I think it's the only time they didn't do the basket throw because on that MTA throw that Victor describes, it went up, and you could see it jumping okay, in the air conditioning. Wait, 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 all you do all day is you get to the next town and you play. I mean, we could sit across from each other in the stands and just play catch. The other, the other guy never had to get up. We had part of our routine was he'd be on the other side of the basket and we just play catch, sitting in multiple skips up, sitting in chairs. Never got up. But that day, that Madison Square Garden in February, February <laughs> of '75. ABC Wild World of Sports is filming it. Hey, <laughs> it's it's a matinee. Two o'clock in the afternoon, twenty-five thousand bored New Yorkers sitting there yeah. reading, yeah, whatever. Noise, Wall Street or... Journal, I doubt it. And Victor and I are backstage, and in those days, it was the early '70s. We needed a certain amount of bravado, so we took <laughs> this big that was hard head, to find. and you go out, twenty-five thousand people. <laughs> Holy crap! And Victor runs out there, and I got the super pro, and I go, man, this is a trip. Boom! <laughs> All the way up to the top, flattens out the super pro, going around the air conditioning. The New Yorkers are start reaching up, trying to grab it. Swish through the other end of Victor, standing like this, and he does, you know, he's, and we're off and going. I'm tell you. I, was, I don't think I was ever higher in my life than that moment because of the roar that came up from those people. They got no idea what they, you know, they had no idea what they were going to see. Yeah. Was, oh and the and problem was what he was, everybody was there about the way. That show, ABC Wild, 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 Wild World of Sports was there, and it was the only time that John and I did make a basket three quarter court. That's shows. because that freaking air conditioning was on. And the disc was well, we took about twenty show twenty shots each. I don't think it was that we whatever it, we couldn't make that shot. That was a real bummer. Well I was I saw the show and I was straight. 
<laughs> and here's, here's what actually happened. John, John threw the first of the huge MTAs up into the air conditioning, and it was about three quarters of the way down, and with unbelievable prescience, look it up. <laughs> Victor, at this point, goes, and the thing goes clean through the basket, never touched anything. Just a clean swish from full court. Swish. And as I remember it, they canceled the basket throwing after that. <laughs> So Z, um, you were there in the early days, and you've told me in the past about Berkeley, about when Victor came to town, he did have that grandiose vision of the play, of, of taking it from hanging out on campus to something else. You want to tell us about that a little bit? Sure. When did it start? Yeah, Vic, uh, you know, I would consider my mentor in the sport always from the very beginning. Um, I. I was uh, pre-med going to Berkeley and I saw these guys who were just kind of throwing it around and uh, it was a perfect thing to do if you had like an hour between classes, you know, go down there and start to throw you could, your mind. I was fascinated because my mind would go completely off my studies. It was like, this was so engaging that I was like shocked. I mean, I hadn't really found that many things that were that engaging that would engage your whole attention. So your mind is refreshed, you could go back to studies. The guys who played outside of Victor, who is you know, from Brooklyn, as we've established, all these other guys were brainiacs, you know, I mean, double master PhDs, working at the Lawrence Radiation Lab, mathematicians, physicists. Chuck Chuck they were, they were that's, that was the core group of these guys. They were just fascinated with the flight. Of course, no, nobody knew anything about Bernoulli's principle or precession or anything like this at the time. In fact, the Navy was doing studies to try to figure out how they flew to see if they could use them as flares. But it was Victor's vision, really, that, that was bringing it up from just this like play thing into kind of sport level. I mean, I've got to give Roger Barrett a lot of credit, too, for, you know, he was, he was very detail-oriented, and, and he created, and he and Victor created mechanical drawings of Frisbees that later became, I believe, the 119. I mean, there may be other people who can help out with that, but we were... There was, we were generally pushing it to become more sport, less toy. We want to set farther world's records. We want to have higher MTAs. We want to be able to do more with it when it comes into us and we're tipping it and, you know, there's this garbage underneath. We don't really need that. So now we've got to shave it out with razor blades, you know. And, and you know, as things continue yeah. to be more complicated. But I've got to say that, like, one of the first things he said, well, you, you know, can you help me write a letter to Charlie O? And we'll try. And I thought, well, this is, you know, this is crazy. You know, we're going to go to a demo at a baseball game. I mean, what are we going to do? Was sort of the thing. You know, well, we're going to do what we do. Okay, well, uh, I guess that'll work. You know, so uh, we write this letter and we get a positive response. He was he, Charlie O was was great as far as being open for for things. You know, he's, he did a lot for baseball because he's always bringing in new ideas. So here it is, a Saturday game. And I remember we ran out onto the field, and you know, those ballparks were pretty big when it's just like two of you. You know, you're trying to fill a ballpark and there's all these people. I was like, but I started throwing dream shots, and you know, Victor was throwing big sidearm behind the back, and you know, we were, you know, a lot of it was about the flight. You know, and people are fascinated still to this day, I think, more with the flight. I mean, as a community, we're more, uh, you know, oriented to the reception and what we do with it when we get it. But, but the general public likes to see the thing fly, and they like to see co oping and see the disc fly between people. But as soon as we were done, as soon as they said, you know, thank you, da 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 da, this guy comes running out like a bull out of the dugout at me. I don't know if you remember this, but this guy's coming running hard at me. It's Reggie Jackson. And he's just running hard, you know, he's running hard. And I'm standing there, and I just kind of stop, and he just comes up and he grabs the disc out of my hands, just literally kind of rips it out of my hands, and just. It's like he ignored that there was anybody else there in the stadium. This is just Reggie in Reggie's world. And he just goes, I didn't know you could do that with this. I didn't know you could do that. You know, and he was just like, he was like blown away. He was like, like, lost control of himself. So, um, 
he also he also we were in a dugout uh, hanging out, and Reggie he saw us with the frisbee, and Reggie and Reggie says, uh, you know, there's a, there's a frisbee in San Francisco. Uh, it's a ten thousand dollar frisbee in the store window, and Z and I look at each other. And what the hell is this guy talking about? You know, and there really was. It was a it was a yellow fastback that had a two carat diamond in the center <laughs> of it on display in the jewelry store. So, so that's a little bit. Yeah, Vic was the man. Definitely the man who uh, you know pushed him into the next. We all have fun. The other thing that I, I find fascinating is they're talking about doing these shows at the Harlem Globetrotters, but you were doing skip shots, throws. You really were not delaying yet. You were, no, no. no. So, so, John, tell we me a little bit about the grass. We would never plan on grass. Tell me about you starting delay. And well, I didn't start the delay, but well, just um, they, in retrospect, it's, it's impossible to not think about delaying, but we had decided that with the... That the Super Pro was the best disc, even though we played mostly with pros. The Super Pro is better because it's larger diameter, you can see it. And they had these bumps on the bottom and all these letters. And they would put these stickers on the bottom that say, not for resale. And, <laughs> okay, we're touring with the Globetrotters. We're get to the place, you got nothing to do all day, you're gonna play. He's we, we do all these all these quick catch routines. And I'm saying, you know that stuff that some of those other guys do, though, like Stork and, and uh, John Connor and those guys? Well, you, yeah, well, you do that to bring the disc under control so you can get it back, because it's all about the flow. It's all about the keeping that flow going. So I got nothing else to do, so I start throwing it up to myself and doing things. And think you're saying, that is going to ruin freestyle. <laughs> if you stop the flow, it won't ruin it. Well, the problem is, when you, so I'm sitting around in some state and flowing it up, and with that little sticker on the bottom, every now and then it would sort of slip, and my brain would go, that's kind of cool. But then it, you, your finger would slide out. <laughs> so, we, believe it or not, we didn't delay in those days. We did you know, lots of tip, you know, the spinning wheel. I mean, you know, weird stuff. And lots of cool, you know, keeping four going all these. And we were very accurate. We gave him a good show, but you can't imagine when we did air bounce things where the trick was, how, can you get it like an inch off the ground yeah. and rise yeah, above yeah. the other guy? Um, we also played the music. Oh, yeah, we had a great food. Yeah, we had a great food. Well. But you know, it wasn't until. I was in New York City af right after that tour, and I was with Kerry Colmar, and he says, well, what do you think about this? And he has a pro, and he fires it up like this, and he had these rhino horn, strong rhino horn nails, nails and Natural. it was a, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, that's a really cool thing, you can do it. that's a really cool thing, but Kerry, Tip from the pros. <laughs> Two hands on your foot. Kind of a bit more wrong. Well, I got something to say about this too. Okay, this so do I. Okay. Let me get <laughs> I, I've talked to both Freddie Half and uh, Cray Van Sickle at length about the delaying dilemma. And it's, it's one of those things where, you know, when somebody invents something, they usually find out like there's like 10 other guys around different parts of the planet, right, that invent it at the same time. It was a little bit like that, coming from different angles. Freddie was a basketball player, so he could spin the ball up on his finger and spin the ball on his finger like basketball players do, you know, they do the whole thing. And that's... That's where he started getting into the lane. Carrie, uh, Cray says he was there with Carrie. What year are you talking? 75. Yeah, it was, what, they, what he was doing was he was tipping, because that was the main thing, tipping, but he was trying to make, you know, there was, in fact, we had competitions, like how many tips how many could tips? you do? So the idea was to do smaller and smaller tips, and then until you're just, then the thing's just spinning. You know, you just did, 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 and then now it's spinning on his finger. And that when that started to happen, then you know, boop, you know, it opened up, and that was the beginning of delaying for Carrie. And then Carrie went on to do the delay for the first time in a tournament. 
but as to the exact date of like who did well, what did first. Did Gary do the first tournament one or Fred? Well, well I, okay, I, you, you have to know, of course, that uh, whatever uh, whatever anybody came up with, Freddie came up with it the next day. Uh, <laughs> that's actually true. And you came up with it the third day. And then, I, <laughs> and the real inventor showed up, and then I took credit for it. Yeah. But, but uh, okay, let me let me say this about about freestyle play and out. It's for the. I'm from Brooklyn, man. I got a voice. <laughs> This. What happens when you're a product of your environment is where you play. Your environment is going to dictate what you can do, what lends you to do certain trick throws or whatever. Spider Wills and Brother Dave, they played on a beach. And their style was they would just throw stuff back and forth. But they would brush the side, the underside of the disc just to slow it down and then do a catch on it like that. In Berkeley, in Sprout Plaza, we played in a wind-protected area on a concrete slab. The style of play dictated that it was throw and catch in the same motion. That's what you wanted to do. You didn't want to tip the disc if your partner's going to get pissed off. He's waiting for you to fire it back. And that's what it was. He's doing these behind the back and then coming down and firing that thing right back again. Then, Freddie and Carrie, they played in Central Park on the grass. And so because of that, that's where I think the nail delay originated because of their environment. Their environment dictated the fact, well, you know, we can't really do skip shots here. And so I think that's how the nail delay uh, came into being, because they play on the grass. It's a product of your environment. He was just, he just mentioned Washington. Yeah, that was good. That was a good story. Nice. Yeah, from New York. Hey, yeah, well, New York. Yeah. Question for Z. Yeah. Question for Z. As the only active competitor panelist, freestyle. What is the difference freestyle. between the spirit of competition you back in Dork's the day? You miss Stork's routine in Santa Barbara? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Stork and Jimmy. That was. Anyway, go ahead. That's right, Jimmy. Go ahead. Jimmy. Jimmy. Go ahead. Jimmy. What, what's the biggest difference? Between back in the day and today, back and in the day play to and today. today. Well, I mean, like I said, the flight is the main thing. I'm, when you're throwing pros, and believe me, Victor and I spent a lot of time in every every store that would carry a whammo disc. That in the area we would go to, as you know, we would ask them, "When are you getting discs in?" And they would tell us, and we would show up, and we'd be there. And we'd go through every one of those. Now they didn't even make a hole in the packaging so you could see what the mold number was. But believe me, we got in there one way or the other. <laughs> we used a razor blade and, and we cut out yeah. a hole in Here the back. We're not even buying these discs and we're slicing up the packages. You know. Split digit 14. And the, people, yeah, yeah. and the people are watching us and they're like, what are you guys doing? It's okay, it's okay. You know, we're just we're trying to find the right disc. So yeah, we're looking for split digit 14s. Reverse ones, things that had a little more, you know, to freestyle with. Those discs move. That's the biggest difference. Those discs move. I mean, you know, like a, like a guts disc. It, it, it will move. I mean, Dream Shot is just all about a pro moving like this, right? And so. But is it all the equipment, but, or is there a different spirit? To well, the game today? you know, this, you know, there was a, the spirits the same. You know, there's a family, just like there's a family feeling here. People come from everywhere. And, and it's a social thing. We had a we had a social group of people, you know, in the beginning, and it seemed like, and there were there were a lot of women involved, and so it wasn't just guys, you know. I mean, it wasn't just you know. So I mean, you know, it wasn't didn't evolve from just a guy thing to you know to you know to what it is today, where you have men and women, right? Right. So, okay. I guess I said one 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 thing, Jim. One thing that. that that really is different when you think back, and some of you were there, but like in the early NAS meets, like Santa Barbara, for instance, where we had, I think it was freestyle and MTA, there were 15 freestyle preliminary pools of 12 teams each. 15 pools of 12 teams each. That was my first tournament, and Z was my first part. <laughs> wow. Yeah! yeah. 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 And I just doing these big Z's. even go, yeah. and I just started. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> and so, so to a certain extent, in terms of you asking, how was it different? It was a huge base of people who were attempting and playing at, at a wide variety of levels, from Corey and Evan and others, you know, Johnny and others at the, at the top, to journeyman players, because just a half a era earlier, everybody did everything. I mean, at those early WFCs, people freestyled all hours of the night. I mean, it, ne people never went to bed. They were out because they were inventing things yeah, yeah. The every on minute. Square Park. Inventing Woo! things every minute. So, so that, in my mind, is the biggest is the biggest difference from anybody who who had a disc in their hand was a freestyler to the level of specialization that we have now. One other thing about carry and and, uh, and the the delay that again goes back to this learning theory question that is mind-blowing to me in retrospect. And that is that carry, let's move on to airbrush, which incidentally the New Yorkers wanted to call side tapping. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, I had control of the media. Nice choice. So, yeah, once it, once it came out in flying disc as airbrushing, that was, that was airbrushing. What's it? So, uh, Carrie, Carrie was a very adept airbrusher. Read side down. And he came down to Jersey Jam. 74, probably. But, Kerry Colmar, unbelievable technician that he was, inventor of the nail delay, probably inventor of the airbrush, he couldn't get the disc into airbrush mode consistently. Kerry, Kerry couldn't get the disc into airbrush mode. I unveil the thimble which allows me to zing it up into airbrush and I'm brushing like crazy because I can consistently get up and brush it. That bought me about a half a year of, of dominance because I can brush it. Here's this guy who's much better athlete and brusher than I am but the poor guy can't get it consistently up to brush it. If you can imagine that. That's, that's what I'm saying. And then fortunately someone developed the wizard. Uh, you know, we were talking about early Frisbee and, and most of the stuff that uh, we're talking about is like mid 70s stuff now. But I, I just want to take us back, okay, before the 70s into the 60s. And the thing was, when I was playing, and we were playing very seriously, I gotta admit, we were playing very seriously at that time. We, we devoted time to it and we met, and you know, we were just devoted to showing up and, and showing what we learned from each other and you know there was that sharing going on but the point was I wasn't the big guy there and I'm still not the big guy so I wasn't winning the distance contest I wasn't winning the MTA but I loved the freestyle I really wanted to freestyle and I kept saying we got to have freestyle in our tournament somehow and it was like oh everybody's like how are we going to judge that you know there's no way we can judge freestyle no way. So that's, that's why I just wanted to bring up this little point. Anybody that ever, you know, has any complaints about the judging system, just realize that it evolved from less than nothing, you know, to, you know, I mean, then store, you know, everybody had their own little systems, and it's, it's kind of evolved to the day. I don't think we have the big controversies that we used to have in judging. At least there haven't been any punches thrown that I've known in the last few world championships. I mean, to me that says that the system, you know, keeps evolving. It's not too late to get Corey uh, Castle back. You know, <laughs> you can, people do want to take swings over the AI judging lately, but, you know, things will continue to evolve, so hang in there. Clearly, we just... Clearly, I could talk about this. Obviously, I'm into history, and I could talk about this all night. So this is just a little scratch of what the early days were like. When I did go to Sarasota in 1980, 
Kirkland was there, Felder Bottom, a lot of great players there. It blew my mind. It's like me and Kessler are like <laughs> these guys crush me. Ching 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 ching. Oh, yeah, okay. But John, I, I watched these guys and John and then just impressed me. So in nineteen eighty I went up and I had it autographed by this. Still have it. Oh, come on. Oh. What year is this? Eighty one? Yeah, we all 1980, 1980, wow. first time I saw the, the big boys. We were, we were in Tennessee living in our own world. And so tonight I want him to sign the rest of the series. <laughs> <laughs> and if the whole panel would sign them, I would love that. I would sign it the same way. So, so Stork, uh, Stork said that 1953 desk he got, well I went back in my time machine and took it off your shelf, sorry, if you woke up that Saturday morning and couldn't find it, here it is. Oh my god! So this is 1953 and if you would honor me by signing it. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, it's my collection, it's my desk, sign it. <laughs> It'll just make it more valuable through time. <laughs> So I want to thank our panel tonight, and we'll move on to the awards. What is it? Okay, we also, Storks, uh, excuse me, Kirkland told me his first disc. Didn't you tell me it was a Mars platter, not a Pluto platter? Well... I really liked Mars Platters for one reason or another. It's just because the sporting goods company back in the 50s uh, just sold Mars Platters. Maybe, yeah, on the East Coast, you would probably have more distribution. Well, I happen to have a Mars Platter if you would argue. Woo! If you would autograph them. Thank you. So I would take advantage of having these guys here. Get your autograph from them. And thank you all for coming. And uh, we really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. After all that stuff we did, it it was just it's still going. I mean, yeah. And, and it wasn't going then. There wasn't anything. And now it's kicking butt, which is kind of cool. So do you remember in Seattle, 1978, playing with Jeff Jordan? Yes. And the long throw and the catch the putt. Do you remember that? Yeah. That changed my life. Yeah. Would you would you have to remember that? Interesting about that is Jorgensen was a lefty and he was throwing left spin, and I was going against the spin buttons. It was spinning like this, and I was changing the spin. So there, there I mean, it wasn't the delay that got me. It was that no, one 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 yeah, and then you oh. see. What you have to remember that interesting about that is Jorgensen was a lefty and he was still on the left spin and I was going against the spin buttons. It was spinning like this and I was changing the spin button. It wasn't the delay that got me. No, one Yeah, and then you see Conway three or four years later doing third world puddle. We have one question that we're going to have Stork answer here and while these guys are signing about and then we'll get on with the award. Uh, just Tony, uh, Tony came up who has no voice because he's an NFL fan. Um, he, he came up and, and asked a little bit about the controversy about nails. And uh, some of you may be uh, new enough to not remember that, but we had a, a pretty, a pretty major controversy about whether, whether we were going to allow um, devices, de devices, uh, and and it was I think I think we put it to a national vote actually, uh, the question of of whether we were going to have people have to use natural nails. Because it was a time. Remember that it, it kind of started started with the um, Montalvo. Uh, Jose Montalvo used a stick initially from Chicago to okay. catch the disc on a stick. <laughs> and you play like this, and then you go. <laughs> and and the inside joke is that it's called a Molina stick because 
I, I mistakenly thought his name was Jose Molina, so I wrote up the article about the Molina stick. And so they continued to call it the Molina stick, even though it was Montalvo. But there was that stick. Then I shortened the stick to just the tape on uh, thimble that, that allowed me to get the, the disc up into position. And then uh, Victor had the, the whiz ring, which was in that, that time period. But we started to say, well, what are we going to allow? I mean, are we going to have people carrying devices to, to catch the disc, or, or what's it going to be? And then people started to, to, uh, to apply nails. That was about the same time period, and I'm neglecting the, the process from peanuts, uh, uh, beer nuts in the disc, to armor all, to silicone, because that was its own discovery cycle uh, that, that was part of this. Yeah, waxes, waxes. But, the floor waxes first. But the first slab. Yeah, and then the razor blading. But anyway, it came, it came to a vote. It came to a vote, and I believe that the initial, the initial um, uh, solution because we thought, well, there's people who are disadvantaged because you know they don't naturally have strong nails, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're gonna go with is that you may have you may have a nail that serves as a prosthetic. That is, it replaces a natural function. So uh, Z, if you'll show us the replacement of your natural nails. <laughs> Pick your nose that's, for it's really natural. That's where it, that's where it ended up. <laughs> But but that was it was a, a big controversy at the time. These and, used to be free uh, too. Even though I play, <laughs> play bear, uh, I think we can agree that uh, that it's a good thing to have nails on. Thanks everyone. Uh, Dave, let's get the awards and clipboard. Let's give me a chance. To <laughs>